good evening and welcome to um, our online uh, service here tonight, here on our YouTube channel, uh, on our Facebook page and also on our website. It's good to be with you tonight and it's good, uh, even though we're uh, not able to physically be together, it's, it's good, isn't it, that we can still uh, come together um, and sing, um, pray together, uh, read God's word and um, have God's word opened up to us a little bit later and it's my prayer as we gather tonight that even though we are apart and and in our own homes that we would have still the same sense of of being ready to come to god to praise him to worship him and that we come in expectantly um that god would speak to us from his word uh, tonight uh, tonight we're carrying on our series in one samuel um, and we're going to be uh, looking at 1 Samuel chapter 26 um, tonight, thinking about uh, those uh, who wait upon the Lord. As we gather and before we um, begin our time together, or as we begin our time together, let's just hear some words from Psalm 37. Uh, to, to encourage us and to prepare our hearts for worship. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree. Yet he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Indeed, I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the blameless man and observe the upright. For the future of that man is peace, but the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Before we read our passage together tonight, let's come together and pray together a prayer of confession as we begin our time. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have broken your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done what we ought not to have done. O oh Lord, have mercy on us, pitiful sinners. Spare those, O oh God, who confess their faults. Restore those who truly repent, as you have promised through Jesus Christ our Lord. And grant, O oh merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live a godly, righteous, and disciplined life to the praise of your holy name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, um, do please open up to 1 Samuel chapter 26. 1 Samuel chapter 26. Um, it's our passage that we're going to be looking at this, ev this evening. We're going to be looking at the whole chapter. Um, and so we're going to read that together now, beginning. Uh, at verse 1. 
Now the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding in the hill of Hilkalah, opposite Jeshimon? Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him, to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul encamped in the hill of Hilkalah, which is opposite Jeshimon, by the road. But David stayed in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. David therefore sent out spies, and understood that Saul had indeed come. So David arose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay, and Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army. Now Saul lay within the camp, with the people encamped all around him. Then David answered and said to Helimelech the Hittite, and to Abishai, the son of Zeriah, brother of Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and there Saul lay sleeping within the camp, with his spear stuck in the ground by his head. And Abner and the people lay all around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please let me strike him at once with the spear right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. But David said to Abishai, do not destroy him. For who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him or his day shall come to die or he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But please take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head and let us go. So David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head, and they got away. And no man saw or knew it or awoke. For they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. Now David went over to the other side and stood on the top of a hill afar off, a great distance between them. And David called out to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Do you not answer, Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who are you calling out to the king? So David said to Abner, Are you not a man? And who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not guarded your lord, the king? For one of the people came in to destroy your lord, the king. This thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not guarded your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the jug of water that was by his head. Then Saul knew David's voice and said, Is that your voice, my son, David? David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, why does my Lord thus pursue his servant? For what have I done or what evil is in my hand? Now, therefore, please let my Lord, the king, hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is the children of men, may they be cursed before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go, serve other gods. So now, do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord, for the King of Israel has come out to seek a flea, 
as when one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will harm you no more. Because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, Here is the king's spear. Let one of the young men come over and get it. May the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand today, but I would not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And indeed, as your life was valued much this day in my eyes, so let my life be valued much in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, my son David. You shall both do great things and also still prevail. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. Amen. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Almighty, all-powerful, sovereign God, we come before you and give you praise and worship tonight. The one who deserves our praise, the only one who deserves all of our praise and worship. We thank you that you are a loving God who is faithful to his people. Father, we do thank you for the demonstration of your amazing love as you sent your son, Jesus, into this world. Father, we do thank you for all that Christ has accomplished for us as he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Father, we do thank you that it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross, that he despised the shame. And now, Father, we know he is risen and reigning. And so we do pray, Father, that for us here tonight, that we would keep our eyes fixed upon our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we we do thank you for this time that we can come together. Father, it's far from ideal and it's far from what we desire. But we do thank you that even though we are facing these difficult and unusual times, even though the doors of the church are physically closed and we cannot be here together tonight, that the word of God, your gospel is still being faithfully proclaimed. And we can still gather and be encouraged and instructed um, and taught from your word tonight. Father, we do lift up to you this current situation we are facing. And, and we do pray, Lord, we know that you are an all-powerful God and that in a moment you could, you could say the word and the virus would be gone. And Lord, we do pray, uh, as we pray with it, according to your, to your will and plan and purposes, we do pray that this virus might be gone, that you may bring an end to this time, uh, that you may um, enable those who are um, doing the research to, to come up with a cure, to come up with a vaccine. Father, all these things are in your hands. All of our times are in your hands. And so we do pray for your mercy and for your grace, for your healing hand your strength as we face each coming day. Father, we do lift up to you, each one of us, um, many of us as we gather here tonight, perhaps some of us are Christians, some of us maybe not Christians, uh, all of us facing different uh, struggles and circumstances of life. And we do know that you are the God of all comfort and, 
and you can meet each one of our needs where we're at. And so we do pray for those who are sick, that you would bring healing. For those who are mourning, that you would bring comfort. For those who are struggling, those who are isolated, those who are feeling lonely, you would bring encouragement. And for all of us, Father, tonight, that you would draw alongside us, that we would know your presence with us, and that we would trust you more and more each day. Be with those that you have given to us in authority, those uh, in power, those in, in government, both local and uh, national. Strengthen them, we pray. Lord, we do pray for our community. We thank you for the great acts of love that we've seen, not only in our own church family here, but also uh, within our community as, as people have sought to care and show love to to others father we thank you for that great demonstration as we've all come together to to help and support each other in this difficult time but father we do pray that for all those who belong to this community again you would you would reach out to them that they would they would um know your comfort and strength and father that as they perhaps listen in uh, to this service tonight or have listened into to, to other services that you would show them their greatest need show show us all remind us all of our greatest need and that is the need uh, to have jesus as our savior to save us from our sins we do pray for those who are facing financial hardship financial difficulty financial uncertainty we do pray for those businesses uh, particularly those who are smaller and local businesses as they seek to find ways in which they might be able to open up uh, safely. Father, we pray that you would lead and guide them, that you would make it possible. And that again, those who are struggling with their financial needs, that you would, you would encourage them and provide for them at this time. So now we pray for all of us as we uh, in a moment we'll sing and then as we come to consider your word we, we pray that these words would not just merely be words on a page but they would be the very source of life source of encouragement to our souls this night may you show us something of ourselves within your word tonight but lord far greater than all of that we want to see jesus we want to see our savior and maybe for some of us we might see him for the very first time. I pray that would be the case. So continue with us now, we pray. For we ask these things in your precious and holy name, the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Me in its deepest pit, I find. 
your Bibles, it'd be good to open up to uh, 1 Samuel 26. Uh, we're going to be following the narrative through, uh, so it'd be good to, to have that open in front of you uh, and to follow it uh, um, as we trace the story uh, together tonight. As we come to God's Word, let's pray. Father, now we pray that you would quieten our hearts, that you would prepare our hearts to receive your Word. Speak to us this night, we pray, for we ask these things in your name. Amen. How good are you at waiting for something? Uh, if you're anything like me, uh, you get an idea into your head and you go with it. You, you act on impulse. Perhaps as a Christian, um, you, you want a situation or, or your circumstances to be worked out immediately. Maybe you feel that, that God is opening up a particular direction for you and your family. Maybe it's a new job, it's a new opportunity. Perhaps we have our own personal circumstances. That of our, in our own lives and, and also a, a, in that of our loved ones. And as we look at those circumstances and situations, we want immediate results. We want God to act immediately. And so as we come to tonight, I want to ask that question, do we really know what it means to wait upon the Lord? See, there is a real danger that as we read this passage and as we think about this tonight, there is a real danger that we, that we, we begin to think, well, well, of course I wait upon the Lord. I'm a Christian. Of course I do. It was certainly my first response as I prepared this week. So perhaps actually as we come to this passage tonight, rather than asking the question, do we really know what it means to wait upon the Lord? We ask the question, how do you know? How do you know that you are really, truly waiting upon the Lord and that you know what that means? Well, here in this passage tonight, we, we see that worked out, I guess, in the life of David. There are three, I think, guiding principles that we see in chapter 26 uh, in David that will perhaps show if we are truly waiting upon the Lord, if we truly know what it means to wait upon the Lord. And of course, by contrast, as we look at chapter 26, we see Saul and his followers who clearly do not wait upon the Lord. 
This passage breaks down into four. I've already said there's going to be three um, principles, guiding principles that we see from David. But this first uh, scene, this first section, really is the scene setter of the chapter. And I've called it the great betrayal, verses 1 to 5. So we'll consider this together and then we'll move on to these three guiding principles. So look at verses 1 to 5. Now, if you can remember back to chapter 24 a few weeks ago, uh, we perhaps were, were, were left with a, an element of hope. You know, Saul seems to have repented of his sins. Uh, he's seen the error of his ways as, uh, as David chooses to spare his life there in the cave. He's promised that he's not going to harm David anymore. And maybe as, you, as, as we looked at that chapter, maybe you even saw it as a bit of a shock horror moment. Is Saul really saying this? Well, of course he did, but... Sadly, and perhaps uh, not to our surprise, it didn't last long. It didn't last long before Saul went back on his word. In verses 1 to 5, as I've just said, they set the scene for, for this chapter. And really in these first five verses, we see two betrayals, two betrayals of David. Look down at verse 1. We see the Ziphite betrayal. Now, we don't know what reason uh, they, were, they were doing this, but perhaps they were seeking, trying to seek favor from King Saul, as they did before in chapter 23, when they decided to give David's position away. And here we see them do the same again. Now, I'm not sure if there's any significance in the way that they betray, but it seemed interesting to me, at least, that they pose this question. Do they know that Saul has made this promise not to go after David? Do they know that he's kind of shown at least the signs of repentance? I don't know. But, but it kind of seems to me a little bit like a temptation. This question that is posed, is David not hiding in the hill of Hilkalah? Whatever their motivation, uh, whatever the reason for their betrayal, as they pose this question, Saul is convinced. And Saul, Saul's heart is revealed. And so in that we come to... The second betrayer, which is that of Saul, verse 2. Having found out from these Ziphites, by the form of this question, is, is he not hiding in this place? Saul's heart is revealed, and it seems that Saul will not and cannot stop chasing David. You know, Saul is an utter mess. And it seems, if you look down at the narrative uh, here in verses 1 to 5, that he doesn't even need much convincing. There's not, there doesn't seem to be much of a battle of, uh, between his mind and his conscience. Now, having been asked this leading and enticing question from these Ziphites, we're told that Saul arose. There's no pause for reflection. There's no pause for discussion. He arose and he went. And so we see in these first five verses that Saul is now on his way, not on his own, but with 3,000, not just any 3,000, 3,000 of the best and the greatest men from Israel to seek David out. What a change from chapter 24. And as you think about Saul and these 3,000 men, it kind of reminded me, I don't know about you, but I, I, I love Western movies. And I love Western movies for, for a number of reasons, but at least one of them is that you can be guaranteed to get that moment when you, you have that standoff scene. When you have people from the two sides who are going to fight out against each other. And they're going to go head to head. And sometimes it's clear that one side clearly has the advantage over the other. Other times you think, well, actually, this could go either way. And there's some kind of suspension and, 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 um, and kind of suspense in that. And you, and you think, which way is it going to go? Here, Saul goes with 3,000 of Israel's elite compared with 600 of David's men. And in that, it's clear, really, isn't it, 
that Saul has not learned anything from these past chapters. Saul has not learned anything from the experience he's faced. You know, just think back over the, even the last few chapters. All these flawed attempts against David, all the times when he's been stopped, prevented, when he has seen the errors of his ways. You know, it's incredibly easy, isn't it, to convince yourself that you're something that you're not. It's really, really easy to convince yourself that you're in a right place with God. And yet, at the same time, we can, we can be miles away. As it did with Saul, a time will come when your heart will reveal where you truly are. And that's what happens here with Saul. Isn't it interesting? The change of emphasis that we see here in verses 3 to 5. Here the hunted becomes the hunter. What do we see there in verses 3 to 5? Saul goes looking for David. Having been given this tip off, Saul goes looking for David, but he doesn't know where he is. David is hiding in the wilderness by contrast. And he sees David coming. He sees Saul coming. So much so that having sent spies out to check what's going on, he now knows that Saul has indeed come. So what does David do? Well, he arises and he stands on that vantage point and he looks over upon Saul and his army. Saul and his mighty men are oblivious. They don't know where David is. David and his 600 men standing looking over into Saul's camp. And really it strikes out an immediate sense of weakness on Saul's part, doesn't it? I have on occasions found myself uh, enjoying, I guess if you can, if you can use that word, uh, a game of paintball. Uh, if you've ever played it before, you'll, you'll know it's both fun, um, but it's also very painful if you get shot at. My tactic is very simple. Stay out of the way and fire at unsuspecting people who are running by. And for all my plans and schemes, there is only one problem with that tactic. The problem comes when you yourself find yourself becoming the target. You know, you turn around in that moment as you hear a noise behind you and you see somebody aiming their paintball gun at you from the undergrowth behind you. In my own created strength, I now feel my weakness. And that's a bit like what we see here with Saul. David stands on this vantage point, looking over at Saul and his men, and what are they doing? They're asleep. So with that scene set, let's look at the three things that will be true of those who will wait, truly wait on the Lord. Firstly, they are faithfully obedient, verses six to 12. Now, here's the first thing we see with David. He is faithfully obedient. In chapter 24, he got it right. In chapter 25, he almost got it wrong. And back here in chapter 26, he gets it right again. With Saul in this position of weakness and vulnerability, the question really that marks this section, this scene, is who is in control? Is David in control? Is Abishai in control? Or is God in control? I wonder, have you ever asked yourself that same question? As you face a situation or a decision, does that question feature in your mind? Whatever that decision or circumstance is that you are facing in that moment, at least in your mind, who has been in control? Has it been you? Or has the Lord, has God? Have you given it over to him? Here it seems really that David has been given, at least in the immediate context, another opportunity to finally, once and for all, get rid of King Saul and therefore claim his rightful place as king. But look down at verse 7. David and Abishai, they go into Saul's camp in the darkness of night. 
Don't forget, this is the king. This is the king's camp. He's got 3,000 men around him. And yet how easily David gains access to the king's camp. And you'd think, really, this is a dangerous mission, wouldn't you? Um, creeping through this camp past these 3,000 men, one false move, one snap of a twig, and they could be face-to-face with 3,000 armed men. There's just two of them. But you see, then comes the moment. They see Saul, and what do they see as they look at Saul? Well, they see his sword, and it's stuck in the ground. And Abishai says, go on, David. Let's do it. The Lord has delivered Saul into your hands. This is your moment, David. Let me kill him. Uh, Because in the position that we've got and what we can see before us, there's no no chance of me failing. I'm going to succeed. I can do it. In a moment, he'll be dead. And David, in that moment, is faced with a choice. Just think for a moment. What must have been going through David's mind in that moment? It was clear that Saul hasn't changed. It's clear that the mercy that David showed Saul in chapter 24 has not changed Saul one single bit. It's had such a little effect. And really, as, as we look at this scenario here, it's, it's now even more clear, if it wasn't already clear, that Saul is not going to change. So the question is, what would David do? We need to just pause for a moment, if we can, before we carry on with the rest of this story. Just pausing on that question, what would David do? Before we, before we rush and jump to give Abishai a tough time, I just want to make one comment about him. I think it's important that we don't miss the reality of Abishai. The reality that sometimes we find ourselves standing alongside Abishai. How many times do we want to seek revenge for ourselves? How many times do we want to get our own back? And let's be really truthfully honest. As we think about this particular situation and other situations that we face in our own lives. Let's be honest, given half the chance, wouldn't we, don't we, take the matter into our own hands so often? Why is it that for for most of us, we love films or stories, don't we, where the bad guy gets what's coming to them? You know, that character that winds you up through most of the story that, you, that you're watching or you're reading. It's because we love revenge. We love to get our own back. We love it when the good guy gets their own back on the bad guy. And justice is served. Despite all that was going through David's mind. Perhaps even the thought might have crossed David's mind. Is this the Lord giving me? Another opportunity to get rid of Saul. Maybe this time I should take it. It's not wrong to think like that. It's not wrong to think, is this a God-given opportunity? Of course not. But the key thing that we have to keep in mind is, who is in control? Am I doing this for my own control? Am I doing this because I want to be in control? Or is God, is the Lord in control? I think we see that thought process worked out in David's mind here in verse 10. Look at verse 10. The Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. See, that's David's confidence. The Lord will deal with Saul. The Lord is going to deal with him. And the Lord will deal with him as he chooses. And David knows in that moment it's not for him to decide. Notice that David uses God's holy name, the the name that's capitalised, Lord, five times in this section. And I think that's significant because I think that really what that's saying is that the Lord is always on his mind. He is prepared to wait upon the Lord for his deliverance. 
And so he resists the sinful desire to kill Saul. Of course, don't forget that back in, uh, in the back of David's mind would probably still be that incident that we've seen uh, of Nabal in chapter 25. The word that David uses here to, uh, for, uh, for strike uh, is the same word that, that is used of Nabal. God will strike. God will deal with. And God did strike. And God did deal with Nabal. And David's response really is clear, isn't it? Immensely clear. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. See, David knew that he should not force uh, the hand of God. He shouldn't force the providence of God by his own actions or desires. David knew that he must wait upon the Lord for his deliverance. And therefore, he must give himself to the Lord in faithful obedience. You know, that's the same for us too. It might be easy to, to misinterpret our actions as, as being of the Lord, what the Lord wills. And the, really, the, the important thing is that we may not know how God will intervene in our situation. That might be the reality for us. We might not know, we, we, we perhaps very rarely know how God will actually work things out. God's ways are not always clear to us. But the key thing that we have to remember is that our ways are clear. Our response is clear. We must wait upon the Lord in faithful obedience to him. So what was the point in this mini but dangerous invasion? Well, notice what we read in verses 11 to 12. David took Saul's spear and the jug of water from beside him. What's the significance of that? Well, the spear is, is the symbol of Saul's aggression and power. And the jug of water is a symbol of his, his sustenance. It's the source of his sustenance. And these things have been taken from Saul without any difficulty. Perhaps to the eye it would have seemed impossible. Perhaps to the eye it would have seemed in, uh, incredibly dangerous. But yet we're told in these verses, they get away. No one woke because they were sleeping. And that sleep was brought about by the Lord, by God himself. You know, David could have taken things into his own hands in that moment. He could have killed Saul, he could have claimed his kingdom. And he could have claimed it now. But notice David would not take it. He would not take it Abishai's way. Because David trusted in the Lord. And really, we, as we look forward to Jesus, we see that demonstrated in Jesus as well, don't we? Remember Jesus in the wilderness, what does Satan offer him? You can have this kingdom. All of this can be yours now. You don't need to go through the cross. You don't need to go through all of this. You can have it now if you will just but bow to me. What does Jesus do? He does not give in to his enemies but rather he trusts in his Father in heaven. So those who wait upon the Lord are faithfully obedient. They have also seen three. They also disarm their enemies, verses 13 to 16. For those who wait upon the Lord, they will disarm their enemies. Now, not of course in our own strength. That's, of course, that's, that's not right. But only as we wait upon the Lord. Only as we live in his and under his strength. Now, actually, this is, this is quite a, a, an amusing section of the story. I think it's important that we don't miss this. Uh, just look down at verses 13 to 16. See, I think here we see a bit of sarcasm from David. Here is effectively David against Abner. Who is Abner? Well, he is the commander of Saul's army. In other words, he is the one who is supposed to be protecting the king. He's the one that's supposed to be protecting Saul. And yet what has just happened, well, we see the reality, don't we? Saul could have been killed and Abner would have known nothing about it. 
And so with David standing at a great distance, he shouts out with a loud voice. Can you see what's happened, Abner? Why have you not done the most important job that you have, verse 15? Don't you realise what has happened while you've been sleeping, Abner? In fact, I think we can take this sarcasm a little bit further when we read what's going on here. As David brings to Abner's attention what has just happened, it's almost as if David is implying, who has done the job that you were supposed to have done? I have. Abner was supposed to protect Saul, but he's failed. And David, the one that had the opportunity and perhaps the motive and the reason to kill Saul, is the one that saved and spared him. Can you see the reality here? Saul and his 3,000 men from the outside, they look like they have the upper hand. And on the head-to-head stats, if you were to bring them up on the screen, uh, you would see that Saul is clearly the winner. And yet David says at the end of verse 16, look where the king's spear is and the jug of water that was by his head. Notice they're not there anymore. That spear and that jug of water that was by his head, they're not there. Where are they? They're here. So what's going on? What does all that mean? Well, this is a visual sign, I think, that Saul has been disarmed. Saul is laying there defenseless. He has no source of sustenance and he has no source of power. A man of outward-looking power reduced to nothing compared to David who waits upon the Lord. And as David waits upon the Lord, he is able to disarm his enemies even when the odds are stacked against him. See, David has not been forgotten. He might have felt like he had, but this would have been a great sign of assurance and, uh, assurance and encouragement to David. The Lord is on his side. Is that your testimony this this evening? Do you wait upon the Lord even when your circumstances and situations seem stacked against you? When when, When you think they're impossible? Perhaps you even feel like God has forgotten you. But do we look for those signs of encouragement and assurance? Do we know, do we truly know the strength that we have as we too wait upon the Lord? See, ultimately, the greatest enemy that we need saving from, the greatest enemy that we need disarming is that of sin and Satan and all his powerful forces. And how have our enemies been defeated in that sense? They've been defeated at the cross of Jesus Christ. So those who wait upon the Lord, their enemies are disarmed, which brings us to our final scene. Those who wait upon the Lord are righteous and faithful. This final scene of this chapter is marked, I think, by verse 23. Just look down at verse 23. May the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. Those who truly wait upon the Lord will be righteous and faithful. But, but, but here's the thing. It's not on our own. Saul demonstrates what it looks like to not be righteous and faithful. But David demonstrates the opposite. What's the difference? David waits upon the Lord. Saul doesn't. And here in this final section, I think we just see two main things. Firstly, we see Saul's almost repentance. It is here that Saul suddenly wakes up as he hears David's voice. He suddenly perks up. But notice as we see this, what will become now the final conversation ever between David and Saul. What does David focus on as he talks to Saul? He focuses on the injustices of Saul. Why? I think to present Saul with perhaps one last opportunity to repent and to change. Look at verses 18 to 20. 
as David talks to Saul, uh, he says three things. Verse 18, what have I done? He's drawing Saul's attention to the facts. What is it that you have got against me? Why are you still seeking me out? Second thing he says, almost then he gives these two reasons, I guess, of, uh, of, of, of reasons um, why he, can, he should repent. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, if, if it's the Lord that's, that's done this, if he stirred you up against me, verse 19, or perhaps it's the people, verse 19, if it's the people that have stirred you up against me, here are these two possible options. Here are these two possible scenarios. Now, why does David respond in this way? Why does he give him these two options? I think David is trying to make Saul's repentance as easy as possible. He puts the cards on the table and offers a way out. But you see, the reality is David knew the truth. It wasn't the Lord. It wasn't the people that had stirred Saul up against him. The problem lay within Saul's heart. All Saul needed to do was to admit his actions. He needed to confess that the problem lie within his own heart and his own desire to rule his life for himself. And that's why I think David reminds Saul in verse 20 that his attempts on his life are pointless. Now you've come out, it's a repeated phrase from chapter 24. It's a repeated phrase, you've come out to seek like you're seeking a flea, like those who go out to hunt a partridge. What's the imagery there? In other words, David is of no threat to Saul. Why are you still seeking me, Saul? And perhaps just as we see a glimmer of hope, we see another tragic and really, really deeply sad moment in Saul's life. Look at verse 21. How does Saul respond? I have sinned. I will harm you no more. I have played the fool and I have erred exceedingly. By the way, that's a good response in repentance. Saul recognizes his sin. He recognizes uh, his problem. He recognizes and he promises an outward response. He knows he's a fool. That's the same word that was used of Nabal, the one to whom uh, who, who rejects the Lord. He knows he sinned greatly. In other words, he seems to realize that he's made a big mistake. He even asks, doesn't he? He even asks for David to return to him. And if this was a true and genuine repentance from the depths of Saul's heart, then in that moment, if Saul's heart had been truly changed, he would have been saved. The problem is it was just a momentary realisation. Have you ever been there yourself? You perhaps have a moment in your life when the, when the truth hits you, but it is only momentary. Before long you go back and you do it all over again. You know, Saul might have given the impression he was serious. Maybe he even thought he was serious himself, but the problem was it didn't last. His heart was not truly changed. What will it take for you and I to come to that place of true and genuine repentance tonight? What will it take for us to truly come to that place where we wait upon the Lord? Are our lives demonstrating and showing our faith and the fact that we have a changed heart? You see, David was righteous in his actions towards Saul. He was faithful towards the Lord. And really, it's in David that we see the great hope of the one who does wait upon the Lord. Look at verse 24. Let my life be valued much in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. See, that was David's hope. He wasn't looking inward to himself. He wasn't looking outward to Saul. He was looking upward to the Lord. David had great confidence that whatever his circumstances, however uncertain, however desperate they seemed, he knew that he must wait upon the Lord in faithful obedience. 
knowing that the Lord would deliver him from all tribulation, for all, from all situations, from all trouble. Now, as we said earlier, or a moment ago, David and Saul would never, ever see each other again after this moment. And the chapter finishes with David and Saul going off in different ways. And that is a clear picture, I think, of what becomes of those who reject the Lord. They go in a different way. Their destination is a different place. And of course, we know that those who reject the Lord will find themselves in hell, away from the mercy and the grace of God. If we are truly repentant, if we truly wait upon the Lord, then we must live righteous and faithful lives. How do we do that? Well, we can't do it on our own. We've said that all the way through. And for us, we can only do that as we come to God's ultimate chosen king. You know, we'll read, as we go on with the story of David, we'll read that David failed. We've seen some of that failure already. We fail. We can't live lives that truly wait upon the Lord by ourselves. But here's the thing, where David failed, Jesus didn't. Jesus lived a perfectly righteous and faithful life. And Jesus makes it possible for us to come to God. And it makes it possible for, our, for us to live our lives in this way. And we are victorious. Our enemies are disarmed. The greatest enemy of sin and death is ultimately disarmed and defeated uh, in Christ's victory at the cross. And we have the greatest hope of one day being with him in his kingdom in eternity in heaven, when we will have the greatest deliverance, the greatest hope of being with him forever. No more injustice, no more pain, no more fear, no more death. But for that to be true of us, we must truly repent and we must wait upon God now and our lives must show it. If you see yourself in Saul tonight, then perhaps you need to come to God through Jesus and repent. And if you want the hope that David has, then our lives need to show it. Living in faithful obedience, knowing that our enemies, sin and Satan, have already been dealt with at the cross. And therefore, our lives must show, they must demonstrate righteousness and faithfulness made possible only through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So can I ask you that question? Are you waiting upon the Lord tonight? Father, help us. To know what it means to truly wait upon you. Father, whatever circumstances we face, whatever circumstances we are facing, forgive us for the times when we take matters into our own hands and we do not trust you. And we do pray, Father, that you would help us to trust you more each day to keep our eyes fixed upon our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Because without him, without all that he has accomplished at the cross, we cannot hope to live our lives in this way. Father, for those who are listening tonight who, who don't know you, those perhaps who can identify themselves more with Saul than with, with anybody else, Father, we pray that you would Cause us to come to you in true repentance, acknowledging that we are sinful, that we have messed up, that we have sinned greatly, and that we need a saviour, and we can't do it on our own. 
Father, bring all of us to a place of true and genuine, genuine repentance and help us each day to truly know what it means to wait upon you in all of our circumstances, looking ultimately to that great day when we will be reunited, when we will be with you in heaven. And what a glorious day that will be. Be with us this night, we pray, and take us into this week, we ask. And we bring all these things before you in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. There is a hope that stands the test of time That lifts my eyes beyond the beckoning gray To see the much last music of a day divine When I behold to saves When suffering sings and songs Sure.